So, hola, buenas tardes. Hello, thank you for coming to our talk, Enhancing the Performance Testing Process for G gRPC Model Inferencing at Scale. Yes, that is a mouthful. That's like 20 plus syllables. So yes, I am Paul Vanek, We're, and this is my colleague Ted Chang. We're both from IBM, Silicon Valley Labs in California. Uh, still a bit jet lagged, very tired, but we're here to talk to you about kind of what we use for production model, um, model deployment, uh, K-Serve and Model Mesh, which there was a wonderfully artistic talk introduction today earlier by Alexa. So a little bit of overlap, but it will be a good uh, recap. And then some performance testing and monitoring setup, and Ted, which, which Ted will talk about. Then we'll kind of go into a, a, a brief demo. So yeah, first let's just talk about uh, model deployment in general. It, it's of course an integral part of the MLOps pipeline of the AI lifecycle. You do your training that you need to, obviously you need to host it somewhere for your applications to consume the model, right? So deploying a model as a microservice is probably the most common model serving strategy, um, especially in production settings, right? So. In this, in this paradigm, the uh, models are exposed via an, a an API endpoint, whether it be REST or gRPC. Um, then clients make a re inference request with their payload to receive uh, inference response to get what they need, right? And as we speak about microservices, of course, Kubernetes is the kind of deployment target of choice, right? So Kubernetes, as you probably all know, solves a whole host of a problem for you, right? From scaling your service up and down, um, you know, launching and spinning up new um, new model server pods as uh, maybe request load goes up and down. Then it allows for zero downtime model upgrades, you know, using rolling deployments, and of course the aspect of resiliency, where you know model serving pod, there's you know, it restarts automatically, right? If there's a, a failed pod, but you know. With all this, even just getting production grade model serving is tough. There are some additional complexities you have to be wary of. You know, so, yeah, complexities everywhere. There are you know, quite many things to consider, especially when you're dealing with a variety of frameworks. You have to know how to containerize them for Kubernetes, um, how you should deploy it, how, how should the inference or inference request um, be formatted. And of course, making sure inference response times are acceptable, especially when deploying at scale. And so this is, these are some of the things that a user would have to navigate when considering production grade model serving on Kubernetes. So back to KServe. Uh, so for those who were here earlier in the morning, um, Alexa did give a, uh, a good introduction to KServe, so I'll just keep it brief here. Uh, so. It's a KSERV is an incubating project in the LF AI and Data Foundation. This was recently added. Originally, it was under the Kubeflow umbrella, um, and it allows highly scalable and standards-based model inference uh, on Kubernetes for trusted AI. So the key features are the serverless inferencing workload. Um, you can serve your models in a serverless manner using Knative. Um, you don't necessarily have to use Knative uh, or Andistio with with uh, with KServe, you can also use what we have, what we call raw deployment mode. Um, this just uses the native Kubernetes resources like um, deployments, ingress, and services, just to kind of deploy your model. Then, one good thing about KServe, it provides the standardized inference protocol, what we call the V2 protocol, and this is something that's been collaborated and developed in the community, especially with folks from um, Selden and Nvidia. Um, and so the good thing about this protocol is that it'll work, your inference request will work across all these different um, cloud providers and I guess model serving runtimes like Triton or Selden's ML server. And I think even PyTorch's TorchServe supports the V2 protocol. And of course, KServe provides an easy to use YAML where you just supply a storage URI, which is the endpoint to your model file. And then you can actually just in case we'll handle the rest and we'll determine where that model, or what type of uh, container or image that model should be loaded into. So you apply YAML, and then case we'll spin up the Kubernetes deployments necessary to serve the provided model for inference. 
So as mentioned earlier in Alexa's talk, there are scalability concerns with this pod per model paradigm, right? Um, you know, each inference service has a uh, kind of has a resource request, and of course, how Kubernetes is resource allocation, you'll, you'll quickly hit the limits of your node. Then, of course, Kubelet has a maximum. I, can, I think the default maximum pod limit is 110, and I think Kubernetes best practice kind of dictates or suggests that you shouldn't have more than 100 pods per node. And you know, there's also the aspect of the maximum maximum IP address limitations, right? Each specific pod and replica of the pods uh, each has its own IP address. So you might quickly, if especially if you're dealing with thousands of models, um, you might quickly exhaust your IP addresses. So all of this leads us to the notion that you need to be able to serve multiple models in a single pod per container. Um, Oh, sorry, you need to serve multiple models um, in one singular pod, right? So we want to reduce the overhead and avoid hitting all these limitations. So this leads us to model mesh. This is something that I work very closely with, and this is something that was open sourced last year um, as a part of the as a part of the KServe organization. It's it's intended to serve as the multi-model serving backend for KServe. So model mesh has been used in production for several years, um, underpinning a lot of the Watson services, um, like Watson um, Assistant, Natural Language Understanding, and Discovery. And for, those, for stuff like that, you have maybe hundreds of thousands of models, and not all of these models are being used, right? Some people create the model and might not perform inference on it for several weeks, and so you don't necessarily have to keep it um, available in memory, right? So Model Mesh has the capability to page out dormant models, right? Pods not receiving any, tra or models not receiving any traffic, and can load it just in time if it does receive traffic. It's kind of falls in line with the k-native serverless approach, but just uh, using in one singular con container. So yeah, so model mesh does handles the intelligent loading and unloading, right? Um, it's trying to find an intelligent trade-off between responsiveness to users and their computational footprint. And so the overall architecture, I'm not sure if you, yeah, you can see that. So a user would, you know, so as multiple predictors or, or models are deployed, um, compatible serving runtime deployments are scaled up to host these models. So you might see several run, serving runtime deployments. Um, default, it's two uh, deployments, or two uh, replicas per serving runtime. Um, so in each pod, you can see that there are three containers, the model mesh container, adapter or puller container for retrieving models from the inter external object store like S3 or Google Cloud Store. And then, of course, the model server itself, which are third-party serving runtime or inference services, inference servers like Triton or ML Server. And uh, all of these support loading multiple models into, into one container. So the, mo the model mesh sidecar, um, they're all connected together. They help route traffic, um, which is performed through the singular Kubernetes service at the top. Um, so external inferencing requests are made via this service and the ingress model mesh pod, which could be any of these, routes them to other pods as needed in order to, uh, yeah. And so that, that kind of creates kind of like your model mesh. And in order to coordinate operations and persist model and instance states, and, an etcd um, cluster or instance is used. Yeah, so, so briefly, some of Model Mesh's key features are the cache management. So Model Mesh treats the set of pre-provisioned um, serving runtime pods at, on Kubernetes uh, as an LRU cache. So Model Mesh decides what models are loaded or unloaded based off of the usage recency and current request volumes. Um, next, model placement will be done in such a way um, to balance both the cache age across the pods as well as the request load. Um, so this just means more commonly used models are placed on pods that perhaps aren't getting as much traffic. Um, and models that may not be getting much traffic or traffic is sporadic will be placed on less utilized pods. Then there's resiliency. Um, you know, if a, for some reason ob object store is unavailable, it'll keep retrying. Then there's operational simplicity. So rolling, hand, uh, rolling updates are handled. Um, you can 
traffic will continue to be routed to an older model as you're deploying a newer model. And once the newer model is loaded in the cache and available to use, then it'll switch traffic to the newer model. So yeah, so Model Mesh does have quite a lot of moving pieces. And you know, especially when running something like Model Mesh in production for thousands and thousands of models. Um, and there are just several aspects that can really impact the effect effectiveness of the platform. And you know, from varying configurations, um, environments, runtimes, and you know, the different types of models you might load, right? And so, this is why performance testing, automation, and monitoring are critical. Um, so, as we develop model mesh and as pieces change, um, you know, performance testing, automation becomes very important. So, you know, this is a platform that serves hundreds of thousands of models. So, we need to be able to validate performance. Uh, with different config, uh, different code bases, you know, different dependencies, models, and runtimes. Then we also need to ensure that uh, new code doesn't introduce um, performance regression. And we need to make, keep doing this uh, periodically throughout the development cycle, right? We don't want to test at the very end of the release um, <laughs> and just be caught, um, caught, caught by surprise by some performance degradation. So you know this is all vital, vital, and you know by creating automation for this and adding performance testing as part of our CI/CD process, and by creating tooling for effectively monitoring our model mesh um, performance, you know this really helps with finding you know costly defects sooner, and so this saves a bunch of time and money. So here I'm going to pass it off to Ted, who will kind of show what we do, what we what our performance testing setup and what we use for our performance monitoring. So as Paul mentioned, um, there are many critical reasons for running performance tests, right? So now I will talk about how we actually run some of the performance tests. Um, so it all boils down to three things, at least for us. So the first thing is that um, the automation framework should run repeatable tests, uh, should be able to run repeatable repeatable tests for every code release. And then second is the load driver. It should be very flexible uh, in writing the workload. And the same workload should be able to run tests in both HTTP and gRPC. And it should be fast, and it should have low overhead. And we are currently using uh, K6. Uh, we have tried other a load driver before, and K6 is what we're currently using. Um, metrics monitoring should be able to monitor CPU and memory utilization from worker nodes and containers inside the cube cluster. Uh, right now, we are using Prometheus operator. So this is kind of like our environment, uh, the performance test environment. So. Uh, we have three nodes, right? So the first node is the automation. Uh, in the automation, we are we use uh, KFP Tecton. This is a Kubeflow uh, uh, pipeline, and then we have K6 inside uh, the Kubeflow pipeline as you know part of the task. And then on the second node, we have our uh, Prometheus operator, which has the Grafana and Prometheus and also InfluxDB. Um, and then the third node is our model mesh. This model mesh deploy on only one worker node uh, because this is, uh, I'm using a very small deployment here. Um, so let's talk about the Kubeflow pipeline. So Kubeflow, as you may know, is an umbrella project for many other uh, smaller projects. Um, a Kubeflow pipeline is one of them. Uh, this particular Kubeflow uh, pipeline uh, is, uh, is running on top of the Tekton backend. So next, the K6 tools. Uh, the K6 load tools is you know, an open source load testing tools. Uh, it supports uh, sending payload in HTTP and gRPC protocols. 
And it's uh, written in Golang, so it's pretty quick. And you, you, can, you can define your workload in JavaScript. Uh, it also provides a CLI, uh, which you can run the script using K6 run. And then it also provides some uh, functionality for you to check uh, whether your test has met any threshold uh, to pass or either fail. Um, and then it also provides output uh, integrated to uh, sending output to InfluxDB. So later on, we can use the Grafana dashboard to visualize it. Now we, we've been talking about gRPC, right? So gRPC is the main uh, API for model mesh. So that's why we keep talking about gRPC. But the gRPC plus the protocol above is usually faster than the REST plus JSON uh, interface because uh, the gRPC is, is built on uh, HTTP2 and it can send the payload in binary format. So last thing I want to talk about is uh, Prometheus operator. Uh, this operator provides uh, many things you know, by default, such as Prometheus uh, DB and also the node exporter, uh, which collects the Linux metrics on your cube cluster. And also it provides Grafana, uh, which can visualize the metrics and you can view it on your browser. So right now, I'll probably show you some demo. Um, so let's switch to. All right. So. Uh, so let's see, take a look first. We have three nodes, and then all three, uh, this is because this, oh, why is it so slow? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, we have three nodes. So one node for, and then this particular node is for the model mesh deployment. Uh, the, so our model mesh deploy is running on a relatively uh, small uh, worker node. Um, it has um, two Triton inference pod, only Triton, two, and then the node itself has eight, eight CPUs and 32 gig of memories, and all the model mesh component is running um, just one worker node. And this is the Grafana dashboard. So this Grafana dashboard is set up to monitor uh, the model mesh uh, metrics and as well as the uh, cluster level uh, system metrics such as CPU and container utilization, CPU memory utilizations, and as well as the K6 uh, Matrix from the load driver. So at this point, uh, let's start a test. And this is the Kubeflow uh, Kubeflow pipeline UI. Um, so I'm going to start my test using the Kubeflow pipeline UI. Uh, so this is a pipeline. This pipeline has two components. So first, the pipeline will deploy uh, 20 models. And then it will run uh, some load tests with the K6 driver. Um, so let's start tests real quick. OK. 
Okay. Uh, so while it's running test, let me show you the number of models on my system. So I have 10K models already deployed. And uh, on the system, there are 5,000 MNIST Onyx models, we can see. And then another 5,000 uh, CIFAR PyTorch models. All these are very small, small models. And while the test is running, you can see the log here. So uh, you can actually see 20 uh, more MNIST Onyx model has already been deployed. Uh, now it's running uh, the performance test uh, using K6. So the K6, while it's running, it's sending uh, metrics to InfluxDB, uh, which we can graph using the Grafana dashboard later. Uh, okay, so let's switch back to the dashboard. Um, so these are, on the dashboard, uh, these, these two numbers are the same, uh, because it's basically saying that, okay, I have 10K model registered, and 10K model also loaded in the cache. And these two numbers here, are the number of models on each Triton uh, runtime pods. Uh, so there are roughly 5,600 and 5,400 here. Uh, you may be wondering, huh, this don't add up to 10K, right? It's because uh, some models are replicated across the two pods. And right now, as the test's running, you can see that each Triton is taking uh, 1,000 requests currently, and uh, the request latency is single digit below like 10 milliseconds or so. And also here you can see the number of total requests coming in uh, from the model mesh server side. And so this is all the server side data. And as the test is running, you can see the CPU also increased, uh, the serving runtime containers, also have higher CPU, also the Triton containers, CPU become higher, and this is the memory, so you can see uh, Triton uses the most memory. Okay, so I think our test has finished. Let me just zoom in here, so you can see a little better. All right. So this is, uh, this top three charts are from the K6 driver. Um, so the test I was running, I was uh, running roughly 100 second load test. Uh, the first 30 seconds are like a ramp up. So you will see uh, gradually ramp up and then run for 60 uh, seconds and then ramp down. So on the client side, uh, I'm using 40 virtual users to drive this test. And these 40 users are running uh, sending payloads as fast as they can. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, some, uh, if you like to emulate real uh, users, uh, you may want to add some delayed or timers for each user. Uh, but for this test, I'm only uh, curious about what's the maximum capacity of my model mesh uh, deployment. So as you can see, uh, 2K, it can take 2K requests per second uh, for this particular model I'm testing. And it's very similar to what the server, uh, the model mesh server metrics as well. Uh, but the gRPC uh, request duration is a bit higher. Uh, like here is reading about 15 millisecond, 20 millisecond. But like down here, the single digit. So that's because the client side uh, may have some network delay and may be spending some CPU time for processing the uh, response data. So it's, it's always good to look at the metrics from both sides. Now the error, we didn't have any errors, so the error is empty. Uh, the error rate is nothing. Um, 
So some of this chart here shows that when, you know, initially when we load 20 more models, uh, it, it showed that model loading un and unloading activity here, and also the loaded model size here. Uh, we don't have any activity here in the cache miss uh, because basically all the models are already in the cache. So uh, to test this, uh, I have uh, some tests also made for this corner case, and I think we can run it just to show some cache miss action. Okay, so I'm going to run uh, this pipeline. Only has one uh, task in it that's running the K6 stress. And for this test, I'm going to uh, run for five minutes, and I'm going to send 3,000, send uh, payload to 3,000 PyTorch, uh, Cypher PyTorch model, and 3,000 MNIST Onyx models. Uh, so I'm here doing, all I'm doing here is that if I hit enough, uh, I'm trying to hit some models that have not been used for a long time, and then to see if that we can get some cache misses action. So it's. Let me just switch. So while this is running, I guess we can take some questions because we're almost at the end of our time. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, so we had a question on uh, Slack. That was the question was, uh, do I have, should I run model mesh if I just have a few models? I think that was the question. Let me just double check. Yeah, should I consider model mesh when I just have a few models? Uh, that is before running into KDS limits on pods, IPs, etc. What would you recommend? Yeah. Oh, it's my mic. Okay. So I think if you just have a few models, so the main, the main, I guess, use case for model mesh is for the high scale, high density, right? You have thousands and thousands of models. If you only have a few models, I think just using this case or single model serving is fits the bill well enough. You can easily plug in transformers and explainers just using case serve uh, single model serving. But it's when you really need to kind of load in and out of memory multiple models just to make room um, and well utilize your cluster is when you want to use model mesh. Okay, it's, it's like, so if you're not already hitting limitations and I think just using case serve is fine. It perfectly fits the bill. Awesome. So Ted, I don't know if you want to explain. Yeah, sure. So if we don't have any more questions, so let me show you. So yeah, because we are sending tests to so many different models, now we are actually getting some cache misses. Now in real life, this may not be a good thing to do to your server because this actually break the LRU, the LRU cache. Uh, but for this is for the test. Uh, we want to test. This, this is how you can test. And here, because I'm sending so many payloads to, to, to two, two different models, so I'm getting two different uh, response time here uh, for two different models here. So I can actually toggle different models here, or both. Yep, so that's it for our talk. So today we have shown you how uh, what model mesh is, and then we have show you how to run performance uh, test on model mesh, and we're actually using some of those tests in the public uh, model mesh GitHub repo for the, our nightly build process, and uh, we do have a few more talks coming up that's related to uh, this co-located event, so feel free uh, to participate in those talks. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Is there anyone that has questions in the audience? 
There's a question in the back. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. In the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that you could post models or to save to save resources or money. So I'm curious how how do you do this? How 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 do you post models which are not in use and then recover them? All right. So so model mesh. Uh, so, so the, one of the main components of model mesh is the third party um, inference services or servers. So we have NVIDIA's Triton. Could be in, Intel's OpenVINO or Selden's ML servers. So all of these uh, servers support um, loading, have a load and unload API where you can load in models and um, unload models. And so Model Mesh acts as kind of like a management uh, management layer on top of that to load and unload based off of usage or usage demand and based off of usage recency. So pretty much Model Mesh handles the loading and unloading. Just it's a, it treats all of the serving runtime deployments in these servers as an LRU cache, right? And it'll, if there's if it's already used up all of the memory capacity allocated for these models, then it'll bump out the least recently used model using the unload API for the model servers. Then we'll um, load in or scale up the, the model being requested. And so that's kind of the kind of the notion behind Model Mesh. And kind of making making use of all the cluster capacity as much as possible. Do more with less. <laughs>